We want you just to come on in close and uh, really in, enjoy this special series. Uh, we have just put together um, visions and dreams of history and, and prophecy. And uh, we uh, have worked on it for, you know, a very long time. And uh, we just hope we can uh, convey to you our feelings about it so it can be a blessing to you. And we have done lesson one, and this is uh, lesson two in this special series. And uh, in, uh, in lesson one, an introduction to visions, dreams, and trances, uh, we, we got over in our teaching syllabus to page four. <laughs> and so we wish to, f to, f to complete uh, that uh, introduction to visions and dreams, and then we want to get into what I call a vision and dreams of history, which is uh, in the in the teaching syllabus lesson two, but in the in the video uh, it'll be divided somewhat. Uh, we we very m meticulously uh, showed you how how uh, the human person uh, uh, only has. Uh, two areas of his life, two worlds, and one is the wake world, the other is the sleep world. And that uh, dr dreams and visions function in both worlds for them. Uh, and that the, that the dream world that he can become uh, in, in involved in uh, is a very particular world in the subliminal area of, of, uh, of, of action. Uh, his conscious mind is is, has moved and his subconscious mind has begun to flow into the subliminal and he's receiving his information in that area and that God takes over in that area and does something and we will also give the negative to that uh, that uh, other uh, alien forces can take over in that area and, and show people things that they have not uh, seen otherwise. Uh, we feel that this is a very important lesson, uh, a series of lessons because in the last days, we're going to see more of this type of thing than ever before. And because we're going to see so much more of it, we should be better informed. Um, uh, something in our generation that has, uh, that has been of particular interest to me is that uh, many of our uh, people, uh, professors and ministers, have really not been uh, capable of teaching uh, the younger generation almost intimidated by the younger generation. And if our fathers uh, do not have something greater than the children have, it brings a state of confusion into the child. And that isn't right. We feel that fathers should have answers and, and not problems, <laughs> and that the children should be taught, and that we have sufficient evidence and sufficient knowledge to, to teach our children truth. I mean truth for this life and for the next life. That we're not in a wilderness of information. Uh, and we're not in a desert of knowledge. That, we, that there is truth to be had. And we're thankful for television that explodes that truth more than any other uh, mechanism that man has ever laid his hand to. And we're glad to be involved in that. And then your lesson number two. We had just spoken about that remarkable, amazing personality, the Apostle Paul. Uh, he was a teacher, he was an authority, um, he was an organizer. Uh, what else could you say about him? Two millennium, two millennium later, uh, later he is better known than he was uh, 2,000 years ago. <laughs> uh, we, we name our children after him, we got little Pauls all over the countryside. And, and uh, uh, we follow his teachings 2,000 years later. What a colossal man, and he was involved. And, and dreams and visions. That's what I wanted you to so that he was no uh, small person, a great person, still great, and he was involved. And so uh, we, we showed you, uh, closing our lesson one, how in a, a night vision, uh, uh, Paul says in, in Acts uh, 16 and 9, this a vision appeared unto me in the night, and there stood a man of Macedonia, that was a European man. Uh, he was not an Asiatic. Paul was an Asiatic. This was a European man, and uh, a Greek from Macedonia. Uh, the, the Greeks no longer ruled the world as they did under Alexander the Great and, and the Ptolemies after them. Uh, but uh, intellectually, they were still the stalwarts of the world, even though Rome ruled uh, impurously as an uh, army and a military strength. Yet the, the wisdom of the Greeks was still in the world. And they were the people that invited 
the apostle to go into the great world of Greece, intellectualism, and, and to the world of Rome, militarism, and to conquer it with truth. And it all happened uh, through a vision. <laughs> it did not happen through a courier coming and bringing a pouch. You know, it, it, it happened by the, the means of a vision. And the very, the very next day, this man said, all right, I'll do it. Now, we'd already spoke of the, the vision he had when he got converted to God, when he gave his heart to God. He, he also had a vision and was knocked from a horse by the strength of it and went blind because of the brilliance of it and, and was healed by a very humble person coming and pronouncing God's blessings upon him. He was healed. Now, we find a third instance of this in Acts the Apostles, chapter 22, verse 17. It says, It came to pass that when I came to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. Uh, to me, that is, a, is a, you know, a, very, a very significant situation, that he was in Jerusalem, the temple of God, and he had to be in a, I presume, a very religious and an ecstatic situation. You know, he had traveled a long way to worship God in Jerusalem, where he had gone to school as a young rabbi, and where he had, and, and where the body of the church was born, and how he was part of that. There was a relationship in being there. It wasn't like being in Rome or Athens or somewhere else like that. This was in the holy place. But evidently, more than that, he entered into a, a condition of worship. And the Bible says here that he entered into what, what he says, I was in a trance. Uh, and so he received information about the rest of his life and about the rising up against him and so forth uh, from this very spiritual situation. Now, not only did the Apostle Paul uh, find himself involved in this phenomena of dreams and visions, but we find that uh, the man who uh, was told that he had the keys of the kingdom, who was Simon Peter, and in the Acts of Apostles, chapter 11 and verse 5, Peter says, And I, I was in the city of Joppa, and I was praying. Uh, I think you have to get that relationship, or you might misunderstand this. Uh, he was praying. And he wasn't a guru. He wasn't meditating with his hands up, saying, Oom, oom, oom. That he was saying, God, my Father in heaven, that made the heavens and the earth, and I am a child of God through the rebirth, and I thank you for life and for breath and for people. And, you know, he was praying. But while he was praying, in Acts chapter 11 and verse 5, he fell into a trance. And he says, And I saw a vision of a certain vessel, descend as it had been a great sheet, let down from heaven by four corners, and it came to me. And so, as we spoke in the former lesson, uh, here was this man uh, that fell into a trance, and he calls it a vision. He saw it. Uh, he was in a temporary situation, immobile, uh, on the rooftop, and this thing happened to him. In the original, there are several words uh, that, that speak of vision in the Hebrew language, where in the English you have the one word. They have the word, the word chazon, C-H-A-Z-O-N, uh, which means a mental uh, sight, a revelation uh, through mental seeing. They also have the word uh, kalon, C-H-A-L-O-M. And then they have the word uh, chilem, C-H-E-L-E-M. Then they have the word mara, M-A-R-A-H, which means a vision of seeing something in a mirror as an appearance of, of being in uh, a, a mirror. Uh, and, and so, uh, and this chazon, a, a mental sight of a revelation coming to us through seeing a vision, uh, this could happen, and this could come in the form of a divine utterance of words uh, coming forth out of your spirit being and not out of your mind. For example, in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24, the book of Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, uh, an angel is speaking to him and says, Seventy weeks are determined upon your, your people and upon your holy city to finish the transgression that sinned against the Most High God, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, that meant 70 years they would have to be um, away from their country and subjected to foreign rulers, uh, to bring a reconciliation for their, for their rebe rebellion against God. And then it says to, to bring in a, an everlasting righteousness, 
And that takes us right down to the kingdom when the Lord Jesus Christ should rule and reign on the face of this earth. Uh, six to nine of those weeks have already been accomplished. The final and the seventh week is yet to be accomplished. There is a break between the sixth to ninth and the seventh week. Uh, that you'd bring in everlasting righteousness. You'd seal up the vision and prophecy. Now, that's what I wanted to get to you. That uh, visions and prophecy is only for this life. It's only for now. It, it, it is not for eternity. Now, love is for eternity. <laughs> Friendship is for eternity. But these visions, they're, they're helpers. Uh, they're, they're helpers. Now, I, I've had visions, and we're going to get into those uh, later. Uh, th these are helpers to help us to know more about God and to understand God's revelation and to be better disciples of our Lord and Savior, uh, uh, Jesus Christ. So it says that uh, this is the visions and the dreams is to seal up the prophecy, to anoint the most holy. That means when the Lord Jesus shall be the King of kings, the Lord of lords, seated upon a throne there in, in Jerusalem. And so we find here in the Old Testament, in the book of Daniel, where this was functioning, but it, it really was talking about the coming of Messiah and the coming of his kingdom. It was an exceedingly important thing, and, and it was called a vision, <laughs> a vision. Now we read also in the Open Testament something very critical. It's in 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 1. It says, The child Samuel ministered unto Jehovah before Eli, who was the prophet in Israel and also the, the, uh, the, the political head of the nation. And, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days because there was no open vision. Uh, it's an amazing thing when God can't find anybody to work through. I'm very sincere with you. When I was praying in the Philippines about a little girl bitten by the devil, and, and she was in Bilibid prison, and I did not want to go there. I did not want to go to jail. I was not interested in, I said, send the Salvation Army. That's their, that's their part in life. They claimed it. Let them have it. And God spoke to me and said, but for this particular case, I have nobody but you. If you don't go, she will die. <laughs> well, I felt sorry for God. You know, he didn't have anybody but me, and I wasn't much, you see. Didn't want to go. There are times in every one of our lives, if God tells us to do something, if we don't do it, there is nobody else, you know, but us. And so dreams and visions can often come because God depends so strongly on you that if you don't do it, Humanity cannot be helped. Humanity cannot be blessed. From the time of the healing of that girl until this moment, uh, possibly several million people have come to know Jesus. It was necessary to get that little girl healed. God spoke to my spirit one time and said, I didn't heal her because of you, to make you popular or anything, and I didn't heal her because of her. I said, well, thank you, Lord. He says, I, I heal her because of the nation of the Philippines, to bless them. I can see it now. There are churches all over that nation that never would have been there. There are millions of people that have been blessed that would not have gotten blessed if that miracle had not taken place. And so with these dreams and visions, uh, they were not incidental. Uh, they certainly were not accidental. But they were purposeful, and there still are. If God gives you one, it's for a purpose. God's not playing marbles. <laughs> God, God, God is playing destiny, and he wants you to become part of it. In Jesus' name. So, in, uh, in, in, in Samuel, when God was speaking to this child, Samuel, uh, there was no open vision. There were not open channels that God could get through to communicate. And that nation of Israel was in a very bad uh, condition spiritually and morally because of it. And, and God found a child named Samuel with dedication, with love, uh, with outreach that said, you can see anything you want to see through me and I'll tell it. He had an open channel for God to reveal himself. Now, also, uh, if you'd like to go back to the Old Testament, in this word, shalom, C-H-A-L-O-M, which is one of the Hebrew words used uh, for these visions and dreams that people see. It's used in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 1, where it says, In the second year of the reign of Mel uh, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed, dreamed dreams. Now, he dreamed every night, as we all do. <laughs> several times and forget them. Uh, but this was a very particular one that the monarch, not only was he a monarch, uh, he was the emperor 
uh, of the world empire, the first world empire, the Babylonian empire, the first empire to circumnavigate the, the total earth and to rule and dominate the total earth, uh, this was the man who was the leader of it. So he dreamed. So it's, it is significant that the top man is the man that dreamed the dreams. And he says his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. He got into real trouble. Uh, he, he had the dream and, and it he got him troubled all inside that there was significance to it that he couldn't comprehend. And, and, and he was troubled and his, he couldn't even sleep anymore. He just worried. He got a lot of people like that living today. Uh, I would say that if you have a dream or a vision, don't worry. If God wants it to be revealed as something, he'll show it as something. Uh, for sure, you don't have to make it come to pass. God is the author of these things and God is the deliverer of these things and God can make anything come to pass. He's not weak. He's not little. He's a great, big, wonderful God. And he can, so don't you think you've got to make something come to pass? You don't. God can cause anything to come to pass that he wants to. Now, when you come to the word kelem, K-E-C-H-E-L-E-M, that was also used. Uh, if we had time to make word studies here, it would be very exciting. I don't think we should do that into this series. We only wanted you to know the Bible is full of this material and, and that God wants us to give attention to it. If you don't study what he has done, how are you going to understand what he is doing? The problem with most of us, we don't know what God has done and don't have any understanding of what he is doing. And for God's sake, sure, we don't know what he's going to do. You'll never know what he's going to do till you know what he is doing, what he has done. The secret of knowing what God is going to do is to know what God is doing. But to catch that, it is very important uh, for all of us. Uh, but in this word, uh, Kelam, uh, uh, reading to you from Daniel chapter 2 and verse 4, says, Then speak the Chaldeans to the king in Syria, live forever. Uh, tell thy servants the dream. We'll show you the interpretation. The king responded to the Chaldeans. Uh, they, were the, they were the fathers and they were the, the heads of all spiritism and all sorcery. And, and so they were, they were the Chaldeans. They were the upper bracket of the fortune tellers. Uh, the thing is gone from me, the king said. And if you will not make known to me the dream, the interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces and your houses shall become a dung hill. Hey, <laughs> that's a bad job to have. I wouldn't want that job. If you couldn't please the king, he'd just cut you up in little pieces and threw you out and killed your family. Verse 6 says, But if you show me the dream, the interpretation, you shall receive gifts of me, rewards, great honor. Therefore, show me the dream, the interpretation. They had no abilities. To reach into the unknown, come out with it. The areas where the devil cannot reach, and this is one of them. He cannot reach into the spiritual elements of the Almighty, revealing the future. He has no capacity. Uh, he may lie about something, but he has no capacity uh, to do that. Uh, the, the, the fourth word in the Hebrew used uh, for these dreams is the word mara, M-A-R-A-H. And it represents a vision as seeing something in a mirror of that kind of appearance. You read in Daniel 8 and 16, the, the great prophet Daniel said, I heard a man's voice, and I was between the banks of the Ulai River. And, and he called to me and said, and, and he, he called and, and he heard him say, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. So God was talking to his servant Gabriel, who was an archangel in heaven, and over, and over the telecommunications of heaven, he is the one that takes the messages that should be taken to human beings. He's the one that told Mary that she should have a child and, and, and so forth. Uh, he is in charge of the telecommunications. Anywhere you see him, he's carrying a message. In verse 26, and this is Daniel uh, chapter 8, he says, And the vision and the evening and the morning which was told is true. Therefore shut thou up the vision. Now, now, God is speaking here and, and saying there are times when God gives a vision or a dream that you not just start talking about it. He said, if God gives you one, you should ask the Lord what you're to do about it. But, but he says, therefore, thou shalt shut up the vision, for it shall be for many days. That he was to control it, uh, record it, uh, put it into something permanent, uh, uh, but it, it, it shall be, but not for now. You know, not for now. And when I get to my own uh, visions that God has shown me, you'll understand that uh, very truly, I'm sure. And then I want to show you verse uh, 27, which is the next verse. And it says, And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days. Now, I want to say that it, it is possible, it is possible that when a vision uh, from God comes to you, that your physical being finds it very difficult to react to it. It is a spiritual phenomenon outside the, the, the realm of the, of the human, uh, natural uh, human uh, power, and, and it can do things to you. And, and the second vision that I had that I'll be telling you about in a later lesson, 
And the second vision there, uh, I hurt all over during the vision. I had pain all over. I, I laid on the floor, uh, you know, even though I was not asleep, it was a vision and not a dream. Uh, uh, it, it consumed me until I had to go to bed the next day after going through that thing for the night before. And so it is true uh, that God can give you a spiritual experience that, uh, that'll knock your physical person for a whammy. Excuse my uh, words. Uh, but you, 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 your natural and your supernatural can flow so close together, and God can come so close to you uh, in visions and dreams and things of this nature and spiritual phenomena uh, that it does affect the human part of you, and especially in the area where you would uh, need some rest uh, to, to recuperate to where you would be actually naturally gained. So he said that when this thing came to him uh, that he fainted, <laughs> you know, he went out, he passed out, and that he was sick certain days until he got himself normal again. And that same verse says, After I rose up and did the king's business, and I was astonished at the vision. And, and, and you want to know something? It's, it's in your Bible too. It says, None understood it. Now, you, you, you may find yourself a speckled bird when you start uh, making yourself available to God in the area of dreams and visions, that God might give you something that nobody understands. <laughs> and and uh, it says, Enoch walked with God, but nobody else knew it. They couldn't see God. Uh, he, he, was a, he was walking on a spiritual phenomena to where he saw God and walked with God, but those around him uh, did not see God and could not talk with God, and he became a particular and a peculiar individual that others mocked him uh, because they couldn't understand him. You come into spiritual relationships with God, and uh, sometimes your wife or your husband, uh, they're not in it, and so they don't quite understand it. And, and your church may not understand it. We've known of people to be asked to leave certain churches. They said, we would prefer you worshiping somewhere else. Uh, we, don't, uh, we don't want it here. Like the man went to a, a church, and he, the preacher said something good, and he said, hallelujah. And the preacher said something good again, he said, well, hallelujah. And finally, uh, a, a deacon, uh, an usher walked over and tapped him on the shoulder and said, would you shut up? Well, he said, no, I can't shut up. I'm so happy. I, I, I am saved. I have salvation. Well, he said, one thing is sure, you didn't get it here. Would you get out, please? And so you can find yourself in a condition where other people do not have the similar experiences to yours, and you may have to look for those who have moved in God, you know. Uh, there are elevations of, in, of information from heaven and revelation, and, and when you rise to a new one, you have to pray that those around you rise with you, that you won't be a speckled bird and, and someone that's different. If you are, have the, have, the, have the fortitude to stand with what God has given you. You can't sin against revelation. Uh, when you know and you know and you're sure you're sure, then you've got to stick with what you know. But, uh, but on the other hand, don't make it a matter of, uh, of quarreling and, and, and fighting. That, that, that God is not pleased with. Uh, when God gives a revelation, He expects you, of course, to live up to that revelation. Whole denominations backslide because they are in no position to accept new revelation, whether it be a dream or a vision from their leaders or from their constituency. Uh, I've known of, uh, of, of what you might call fundamental churches, and God speaks to some of their people and says, now, move into a higher plane through fasting and prayer. And they don't do it. They go ahead and live the same carnal lives that they have been living, and the church becomes a club to where they meet together for social functions and, and, uh, and, and not for the supernatural. <laughs> you mentioned the supernatural in some churches today. They say, ho, oh, oh, ho, something wrong. No, not something wrong, something right. Uh, you know, somebody's contacted God. Somebody's come into an area of, of knowledge and wisdom. And somebody's reached up into God in, in a very wonderful and remarkable way. And, and so uh, prepare your heart in the last days. I, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. I was just reading early, early today, <laughs> uh, uh, before you got up, uh, early today, in Luke 24 and 23, they said, and, and we saw a vision of angels. And we saw a vision of angels. And when they, when they made known their witness, you know, others said, oh, oh, you did. You know, don't expect everybody to go along with what you've received from heaven. All you need to do is to be sure and positive that the thing is real and then be willing to die for it. You know, that, that's the system. Be willing to die for it because you know it's real and, and you're positive that it's real and then you stand for it. 
Well, we've just gotten started into one of the greatest uh, uh, section of lectures that we've ever engaged in called uh, Visions and Dreams of History and Prophecy.